Exploring the world of old Xeons is like falling down a rabbit hole. If all you know of the world of Intel CPUs are the basic i3s, i5s, i7s and i9s, you really are missing out. In the desktop arena, there's not much to say, they really are just differently clocked versions of the consumer chips we already know about, but the big socket chips are where things really get interesting. Some of them could overclock, some of them had incredible amounts of cache and mind-boggling numbers of cores and threads. Most of them have little real appeal for the average gamer in 2023, but in some select cases, CPUs like this one might just have piqued your interest. The Xeon E5 2680V2 once more has one of those inscrutable names that probably made sense in the boardroom. Like the E5 2670 I looked at previously, this is a big socket Xeon, as indicated by the E5 name, and being 2000 series means it can work on dual socket motherboards as well as single socket, but beyond that, the numbers don't say much. The V2 is the only indicator that means anything significant, marking this as an Ivy Bridge E chip. It still fits nicely into the Socket 2011 boards that the previous versions did, though if you have a particularly old motherboard, you may find that you need to update your BIOS in order to get it working. Ivy Bridge on 2011 takes things further than Sandy ever did, with 2000 series CPUs offering up to 12 cores. This particular model doesn't reach those lofty heights, having a mere 10 cores, 20 threads and 25 megabytes of L3 cache, with an all-core clock speed of 2.8 GHz and single-core boosts up to 3.6 GHz. Like the Sandy Bridge chip, the 2680V2 lacks AVX2 instructions, and in my experience rarely approaches its rated single-core frequencies, but also like the previous chip, it can be coaxed up above its limits using throttle stop to increase the power limit and max out the multiplier and turbo duration, I was able to obtain 3.1 GHz on all cores, a 300 MHz boost above stop clocks, and still well within the capabilities of a conventional single tower air cooler. Why is that important? Well, a CPU like this might not make a whole lot of sense for an expensive, overclocking friendly motherboard and AIO liquid cooling, but might be of interest to someone with less money to spend. You see, the E5 2680 V2 is currently available for less than 20 British pounds sterling on eBay, and potentially even less on AliExpress. There are also similar models with 10 cores and 20 threads, but lower clock speeds that can be had even cheaper than that. A chip like this, without much in the way of room for playing with clock speeds, doesn't put much stress upon cheaper motherboards and heatsinks, unlike some of the more esoteric Xeons, like the monstrous 1680 V2. Of course, none of that is remotely important if the thing can't game, so to find out how it does, I'll be running it through my standard CPU test suite on my ASUS Rampage 4 Extreme with 16GB of quad-channel DDR3 clocked at 1866, kept cool under a Cooler Master Hyper 212, and kept fed with frames by a GeForce RTX 3070. Of the 18 or so CPUs in my spreadsheet so far, several of which I haven't published yet, the E5 2680V2 comes in ninth place in Valorant, scoring over 220 FPS. Although this chip has tons of cache, and I know Valorant loves that stuff, it doesn't have the single core performance or newer instructions to push this title into the stratosphere. Still, if you're worried this £20 CPU can't fully max out a 240Hz monitor, it's possible you need to re-examine your priorities. The Socket 2011 CPUs all fall within a pretty small window of performance in Battlefield 5. I'm now 99% convinced that limit is caused by the lack of AVX2, as the only chip that can brute force much past 100 FPS is the overclocked 1680 V2. The 2680 V2 manages 99 FPS on average, which is respectable considering its low clock speeds, and does make me wonder how a 4.5 GHz version would cope. But then again, given how much stronger Haswell e-chips are in this title, I'm not that curious. Fortnite's results are disappointing, but perhaps not all that surprising. 
In performance mode at 66% scaling and averaged across three games, the 2680v2 can't even beat the 2670v1, which was 100MHz slower and running on four fewer threads. Granted, the stutter was pretty rough on the 2680v2, but still. You might think I'm insane for complaining about a 144fps average, but for context, the i5-2500K hits almost 200. The 2680v2 sees a reasonably healthy step up from the older 8-core chip in Flight Simulator. That CPU averaged 33 FPS, whereas this 10-core managed to lift that up by over 15% to 38 FPS. Given the style of game, I think most people would say high FPS aren't critical to your enjoyment, but the 1% lows on any of these lower clock chips present a few painful moments of stutter. The 2680v2 performed better in Spider-Man Remastered than the last Xeon I tested, but then again it couldn't have done a whole lot worse. At least this time the game didn't stop to catch its breath mid-swing. Ok, maybe I'm being harsh, but never mind that. The Ivy Bridge chip handles the game about as well as any other chip on this architecture, averaging 67fps without RT enabled. Turning on RT doesn't have quite the huge impact that it did on the Sandy Bridge Xeon, and at 48 FPS, this one isn't all that far off some of the overclocked chips in this family. Cyberpunk's results almost look like a carbon copy of Spider-Man's. Without RT, things were generally smooth, barring a small amount of loading stutter. The 67 FPS average on the whole is pretty comfortable and is in the upper echelons of CPUs I've tested so far. Dropping from Ultra with DLSS quality to Medium with DLSS balanced had no appreciable impact on frame rates, so at least for rasterized performance, this 60 to 70 FPS average is as high as you're going to get regardless of your GPU. With RT enabled, averages dropped to 50, which is still an impressive 20% above the 2670. With quality FSR enabled, Red Dead Redemption 2 isn't being held back by the GPU, meaning that the 72.6 FPS average I found from my walk around Saint Denis is about what you can realistically expect from this CPU. 1 and 0.1% are a little lower than I found with the 2670, and this occurred on two separate runs for some reason, but on the whole, this is nearly identical to the older 8 core. The fact that you're seeing Elden Ring at all in this video should tell you that this CPU can't really run Elden Ring at 60fps. At least, not often. The 2680v2 only beats the previous gen 2670 by 10% here, averaging 52 fps with dips into the 40s. The GPU is far from being taxed, with utilisation at a maximum of about 75%. The best CPUs for this socket with the highest clock speeds can do remarkably well here, so I think the lack of overclocking is what's really hurting the Xeon. Taking Roach for a ride through the newly remastered Novigrad in The Witcher 3 is a pretty CPU intensive activity, and I'm sad to say most of the CPUs I've tested so far don't perform particularly well. I generally have to resort to doing two passes, otherwise the first run tends to stutter a bit while loading shaders and often results in single digit 0.1%. My second pass was much smoother, but the 41 FPS average and 28 FPS 1% were basically a tie with the older Xeon 2670. Slipping in a few results from some forthcoming reviews for comparison, and we can see just how much better results can be had just two generations later. Finally, Civ 6's average turn time comes in a pretty unimpressive 0.18 seconds faster than the older 8-core Sandy Bridge at 7.29 seconds. On the bright side, however, that is only 5 hundredths of a second behind a locked 7th gen quad-core i7.
As with the 52670, any conclusion I make about the 2680 V2 is somewhat overshadowed by the alternatives. Sure, this is a pretty decent value at under £20 for 20 threads, it performs pretty well for a decade old server chip, and it's pretty cool that we can get a bit more performance from it with a simple trick in throttle stop. However, unless you already have an X79 platform you're unwilling to get rid of, there aren't a whole lot of reasons to consider buying this chip. In the context of someone shopping for a budget gaming setup on AliExpress in 2022, the X99 motherboards aren't much more expensive. The CPUs are often cheaper for a similar spec and benefit from AVX2 instructions and DDR4 RAM. They can also be forced to run at their maximum boost speeds across all cores using a BIOS hack, though I've yet to test that particular trick for myself and I expect it will place some higher demands on the cooling and the motherboard's power delivery. I can imagine a few use case scenarios for gaming with these Ivy Bridge Xeons, mostly involving old workstations from Dell, HP and the like. That aside, gamers on a budget should probably look elsewhere. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.